picking up where I left off yesterday, but actually I'll rewind a little bit um, just to uh, let everyone reload this stuff into memory. Um, and then we'll uh, take off with the, with the new stuff. Okay, so I spent the last maybe 40 minutes yesterday talking about stochastic gradient methods. Uh, just to remind you, we were most interested in these classes of problems where the objective was the sum of a bunch of functions like that. And we um, talked about applications. We came up, mostly we talked about this basic scheme where you have an estimate of the gradient and you take a small step in that direction. Uh, we did some analysis of that. We proved rates like for the strongly convex case, rates of uh, about 1 over k, where the um, uh, our measure of the error went down like 1 over k, where k is the iteration count. We talked about it as these averaging approaches that get a slower rate but are more robust to the choice of the constants. Okay, and then um, we did some analysis of that full, for the purposes of full disclosure. I put all the all the analysis on the slides there. Um, and then I finished up, I think, by talking about the constant step size case, where uh, again, we're dealing with a strongly convex case, but the idea here was that we were given a threshold below which we wanted to get the accuracy level, and um, we figured out how to set the step size to some constant to achieve that threshold after a reasonable number of iterations. And again, we just had Two slides was all it took to, to pretty much completely analyze that case, modulo a few little details. Okay. <laughs> all right. Gee, I didn't realize that was so funny. I haven't even told my joke yet. All right. Um, okay. So, um, so that's where we ended up. And, and I wanted to take off a little bit from that. You might have heard the term mirror descent. It's been bandied around a lot at, at uh, machine learning conferences. Um, and really it's just a generalization of that averaging scheme I showed you earlier. And I'll just say a little bit about this because I think uh, Professor Osho, when he gives his talks later in the week, he's going to probably talk about this in more detail. But it sort of starts from the, mirror descent starts from the observation that um, what we're doing in taking the, the step in the estimated gradient direction is solving this little quadratic subproblem. okay? So the step we're taking is xk plus 1 equals xk minus alpha k times g. Now that's the same as solving this problem for z, okay, solving this quadratic problem. If I take the derivative of this thing and set it to 0, I get that z is exactly equal to that formula I showed you earlier. So the next question is, well, what happens if you're actually solving a constrained problem, if, if, you, if x is not completely unconstrained, but instead you want x to belong to some set omega, okay? Um, you can just add um, z equals omega to this minimization problem and solve that, okay? And most of the analysis that I showed you will continue to go through. However, for some sets omega, for some constraint sets, it could be sort of tricky to solve this subproblem. It could be non-trivial effort, okay? Sometimes easy, sometimes tricky. So the, the observation is that this little term here, the purpose of this term here is to stop the step from going too far. All right, This sort of keeps xk plus 1 somewhat close to xk. Because if, if it's too far from xk, this term grows too big and sort of incur, you incur a penalty. So the observation is, well, you don't really need to use a sum of squares here or this Euclidean norm. You can use any function that grows as its argument grows. Okay. You can, you've got a lot of flexibility in how you define this function here. And in mirror descent, the idea is that you just choose some other measure of proximality, and you choose one that's sort of attuned to the set omega, so that it is a valid measure of proximality, and the subproblem that you have to solve here, when you add this constraint z belonging to omega, is easy to solve, okay? They're the two ideas behind, uh, behind mirror descent. And I've got some details here of how you construct these prox functions, these alternatives to the, to the two norm. So this is the, just the problem I showed you on the previous slide, but I've added this restriction z belonging to omega, and I've generalized the prox term to some other function v. And v grows as z moves away from xk, all right? So how do we construct this function v? Well, we take the set omega, it's specialized to the set omega, and I define some norm on that set, may not be the Euclidean norm. There's a lot of generality here, but it has to satisfy the axioms for, for a norm. And then I choose this function little omega, 
to, be, uh, to satisfy a strong convexity condition over the set omega. So in other words, if I have any two uh, vectors x and z in the set big omega, little omega has to satisfy this, this strong convexity condition. So this is like the strong convexity condition that I showed you yesterday with little mu equals one. Remember we talked about little mu being the modulus of strong convexity. Well, this is exactly that definition in a little bit slightly modified form with mu set equal to one. So given that we've defined omega in that way, we can now define V to be basically the deviation of omega from linearity, okay? So that V of X and Z is given by this formula based on the definition of little omega. And a, a picture will help here indicate what's going on. So little omega, it has to be a convex, strongly convex function. Here it is here. And V of X and Z is basically what you get by taking a tangent to the graph of little omega at the point X and then seeing by the time you get to, to z, seeing how different it is between omega and the tangent approximation. That gives you v of x and z. And you can see the, the further you move away from x, the more that v is going to grow, okay, in either direction. So it's a valid measure of proximality. All right. So the idea is that you just substitute that v into the subproblem. And as I said, for some um, definitions of omega and for some choices of little omega, uh, the su resulting subproblem is relatively easy to solve. Now, there's one special case of this um, that's uh, maybe the only really convincing uh, argument for doing this generalization, and that is where omega is the simplex. Omega is the set of vectors in Rn that are all positive and they sum up to one. So it could be, for example, a probability vector over n different events, okay? And that's quite common in, in a lot of applications of of these methods. Now, for this particular simplex, this omega here, the entropy function, omega, happens to have that strong convexity property for this simplex, okay? And therefore, we can construct from that the V of X and Z, which is this function here, just following the definition on the uh, two slides back. And then you can plug this into the subproblem for the prox term, and that gives you something that um, is relatively easy to minimize over the simplex, all right? Now the advantage of uh, doing this is first of all it's sort of more, it's practical and secondly you can generalize most of those convergence results that I showed you for that averaged method to this um, more general setting. And as I said Osho will probably talk more about that. So I had a couple more um, methods of stochastic gradient type uh, but I don't think I want to talk about these too much. I've got a, a few too many slides, so in places I'll just skip over some topics and leave you to go and look at them and ask me questions if you have. In other places I've got some more or less complete proofs like I was showing you yesterday, but we may not have time to really go into the gory details. And again, I'll let you um, uh, peruse those at your leisure. So this is one topic I just want to mention. Um, uh, again, it's for the case where you've got this uh, separable or partially separable sort of objective. Um, and I just wanted to note, I told you yesterday about the heavy ball method. The heavy ball method was where we took a little step in the direction of the negative gradient, but we also added this momentum term, okay, that sort of kept heading in the direction that we just moved. And conjugate gradient did much the same sort of thing. So now uh, the observation here on these incremental type methods is Let's take the gradient of f, which we can no longer evaluate economically, and let's just replace it by some sampled gradient. So not, in other words, we do what we do in stochastic gradient, which is to pick one of these terms from this sum at random and use its gradient as the, um, as the approximation of the gradient of f. I should have added a scaling term here. I should have scaled by m, but anyway. Um, Okay, so we take steps of that form. So it's the heavy ball, but with a sample gradient approximation. So Bertsakis does this, and he's, he and his co-authors have been investigating these methods going back some years. So that's one approach. Another approach is where you uh, do something like the dual averaging that I told you about yesterday, where you don't just use the latest gradient estimate, but you average over all the gradient estimates you've seen so far, all right? And use that as the search direction instead of just the latest gradient. So that's another possible approach, okay? And both of these have been analyzed and there are some sample results on uh, for methods of that kind, okay? Which I won't discuss, but I'll, I'll let you look at those. All right, so as I mentioned yesterday, there was a lot of work happening in the machine learning community on these stochastic gradient type methods 
for a long time independently of what was happening in the math community. And people in machine learning even came up with, they came up with codes, they came up with analysis, they came up with methods that were very effective in, uh, for certain kinds of problems. Uh, there's a code by Batu that's now quite old, um, but very uh, straightforward. I mean, all of these things are very simple to program. There's another code by, called Pegasus by uh, Nati Srebro and uh, Shai Shalov Schwartz that's now also, also about five years old. Uh, there's a bit more detail on stochastic optimization in this tutorial from ICML two years ago that uh, is pretty easy to track down on the web. And I just wanted to mention very quickly that there's a connection between this stuff and the online uh, pro convex programming approach of Zinkovich, which is now about 10 years old. The setting here is different. In, in Zinkovich's approach, you don't, again, you assume sort of a partial separability thing, but you don't assume that you're able to sample randomly from the, um, from the list of functions. Instead, you're being presented with functions one at a time and you have to make a decision about how to adjust xk. Um, so as to sort of um, uh, do a good job of minimizing over the, the set of functions that you've seen so far, all right? So there's not necessarily randomness going on, although there can be. In fact, it could be an adversarial thing going on where the, the, the person that's presenting with the functions could be sort of trying to pick the functions to confuse you to the maximal extent, all right? So, but, but some of the results and some of the analysis and, and some of the approach in terms of step lengths and so on definitely has relationships to SGD. But I won't dig into that. All right, so now I want to say something about how you might implement stochastic gradient in parallel. Now, as it's written, again, I'm going to go back to the basic stochastic gradient method where you just estimate, uh, you come up with a, a gradient estimate and you take a small step in that direction. Now, as it's written, of course, it looks completely serial, right? You have to know xk, you have to make your estimate of g, and then step to xk plus 1. So it looks very serial. So, uh, you know, is there any way we could uh, conceivably parallelize it in a credible way? And people have been looking at that in recent years, and there, are, there have been a few uh, things proposed. I'll talk particularly about the last one, because that was the one I was uh, involved with. But one approach is dual averaging. So again, the idea here is that you don't just use a, a single gradient, maybe at a single data point, as your search direction, but you evaluate a bunch of them, um, and possibly on different cores, okay? You might have a multi-core architecture, and each core could be evaluating one or a small batch of um, gradient estimates. And then it could pool those estimates to get an averaged you know, estimate taken over a larger amount of data and take an SGD type step in that direction, okay? So these authors have looked at methods like that. They sort of um, set up uh, a message passing uh, structure between the different cores and possibly not even, um, possibly even within a cluster rather than a single uh, chip. And they sort of, uh, they have each core do some evaluations. They have a way of summing them all up, doing a global sum, and then taking a step, and then telling each processor what the result of the step is, okay? So that's one approach. Another one is a round robin type approach, and this again dates back a couple of years. And the idea here is that each core is working on evaluating its estimate of the gradient in parallel. But they take turns at updating x, okay? x is in some centrally stored repository that all the cores have access to. And each core does a gradient evaluation, waits for its turn, and then updates x. So it's a round robin. They just go, keep going around in a circle, all right? So that kind of approach works pretty well if these, as we'll see, I've got some results later on, but it works well if the gradients are expensive, right? Because if the gradients are expensive, you're not going to have a core waiting for a long time for its turn to update x. On the other hand, if the computation is dominated by the, the time taken to read-write from memory, um, this approach is not very efficient because each um, core will evaluate its grad f and then it'll have to wait for its turn again. And that's not going to be particularly efficient. So we have this other approach called Hogwild where it, it's somewhat different it's, and it's much more asynchronous. Again, there's the idea that each core is evaluating its estimate of the gradient, but then it sort of, uh, it, it writes to memory uh, as soon as it's got its estimate. It, it goes and updates its components, the ones that it's just updated, or the, the ones that it's calculated new value for, and writes those into the centrally stored X, okay? 
Now, this works well because when, as is often the case, each gradient, each fi in that sum, only depends on a few components of x, all right? Because it only needs to read a few components of x in order to evaluate its gradient, and then it only needs to write to those same components, all right? So, very often, you've, this is exactly the sort of problem you're dealing with. You've got a very large number of terms in the sum, but each term only calls on a few elements of x. Now, they do this completely randomly, so core 1 might update its components, and then, uh, and then core 2, by the time um, core 2 gets to write its components, it's going to be overriding the changes that core 1 just made. All right, so you can get this sort of clash going on because of the asynchronicity of how this is working. Um, but because each update is relatively sparse, um, they're not going to interfere with each other too much. That's the idea. So you will get some overriding of information, but because the overlap between the different vectors is relatively small, different subvectors, there's not too much of a clash going on. So let me be a little more specific about how this works. Very, very simple. I mean, pretty much the whole algorithm is summarized here, although I've changed the notation a little bit. So first of all, we just take a single term from this sum, from the sum, f of x is the sum from i equals 1 up to m of f i of x. You just pick a single i, okay? Sorry, I've changed the notation on you. You read the current state of x. So this is what each core is doing. It reads the current state of x. It usually doesn't have to grab the whole of x. It just has to grab the subvector that its particular um, piece of the function uh, needs to know, okay? Then it evaluates its piece of the gradient, or the gradient of its piece of the function, and then it goes and updates those elements of x. So it does this as a single operation. It grabs xv and updates it. And you can do this in a single, you know, assembly language operation, okay? So each processor is doing this. It's not trying to synchronize with the other processors. It's just working completely independently of the others. Okay, so the only time you're going to get memory contention or you're going to get potentially work overwritten is when two different processes are trying to access exactly the same element of x. Okay, and that can happen, but it's not going to happen all that often. Okay, so here are some, uh, a few more details on this method and the sorts of convergence results we can get. Now one issue is that, th this is a very important issue, is that by the time you go to update your element of x, it might be old, okay? It might have already been updated by other processes. And so the gradient that you're applying to into x was a gradient based on a value of x that was somewhat old, okay? It's not the most recent up-to-date value of x because other processes might have been updating it in the meantime. So we've got this delay going on. And in the, in the analysis, we assume that the delay isn't too bad, okay? We assume there's a value tau, it might be 10, it might be, a, you know, 50 or something that says how many iterations old your value of x can be by the time you get to write, you get to uh, update it, all right? So we assume that's not infinitely long. So in other words, you know, if some processor gets hung up and takes too long to come back with its uh, update, we just throw that update away, okay? Because you can easily check how old it is. You can just have a, a counter somewhere that, that tells you if the update is too old. Uh, all right. Um, there's some other little details that, I, uh, that I, I should tell you here, and that is that um, we actually have two versions of this method. One version doesn't exactly do this. It just picks a single component of E, E being the uh, subvector that uh, this processor is trying to update. It just picks one of those components at random and just updates a single element of X. So that's one thing that we analyze. And the other one assumes that you can update all the elements that this component has modified in a unitary fashion, all right? That you get a temporary lock on part of the vector x and you update those. That's just a little, um, a little detail to make the analysis tractable, but in practice it's not very important. Okay, so we have a paper on this last year, but we recently were visited by Peter Richterich, who's a researcher from the University of Edinburgh. Uh, he visited us a couple of weeks ago and showed us that the analysis that we had in, that, in our paper could be simplified quite substantially, and the results could actually be strengthened a little bit. Um, and the approach that he took is very much like that short step, uh, constant step approach that I told you about yesterday for SGD. It, 
the sorts of results that he got are really sort of generalizations of that, okay? And let me just sketch what they are. Well, you need a bunch of different quantities here. You need to know that L, which is sort of the upper bound on the um, eigenvalues of the Hessian, or alternatively you can think of it as a Lipschitz constant on the gradient. You need the constant of uh, convexity, the modulus of convexity mu. It tells you how strongly convex the function is. You need M, which as you recall from yesterday, that's the bound on the size of each gradient estimate you're, that you're getting. D naught is a measure of um, basically how far you are from the solution. Okay, I haven't defined that precisely, but, uh, but it's just how far away you start. And you need a couple more measures in order to analyze Hogwild. You need to know how much potentially, how much overlap do you have between different subvectors that are touched by different elements in the sum, F, the sum of Fi's. Okay, so we have this measure rho of E. And essentially it tells you for a given um, uh, function, a given single function Fi, how many other functions does its subvector overlap with, okay? So this can be anywhere between one, or between zero and m, or I guess one and m, because it obviously overlaps with itself, okay? So it can be anywhere between one and m. m here is equal to the size of e, okay? Sorry about changing the notation, but m is e the number of terms in the sum is equal to the size of e, all right? And then there's this quantity rho, which basically tells you the fraction of other edges or other um, terms in the sum each term overlaps with, the average amount that each term overlaps with, with other terms in the sum. So rho basically is a measure of how much interconnectivity there is between different subvectors in different terms of the sum. If rho is small, then the terms in the sum are almost independent of each other, and so there's not much harm to be done by, by updating them in parallel. If rho is close to one, that's indicating that, that each term fi in the sum is touching um, almost all of the vector x and is sort of interfering with almost all of the other terms and so we get sort of slower convergence because of that. So I'm just going to cut to the chase and show you the final results here. Again our measure of optimality is the error in f, okay, how far is f from the final optimal value and we want that in expectation to be below some threshold epsilon, okay, that's what we're aiming for. And this is what, this is how we need to choose alpha, constant step size scheme, um, and this is, how, this is how many iterations we're going to need. So all I'll point out about this is that you'll see all these constants that I talked about creeping into these definitions. The modulus of convexity mu, the bound on the variance, the Lipschitz constant, the number of terms in the sum. This is a new one. This uh, didn't show up in the um, constant step size for just the straight SGD, the non-parallel SGD. And you'll also see the other things creeping in here. The tau, which is the maximum delay you can have in doing the update. The rho, which quantifies the amount of overlap between the different subvectors. You can see the longer the delay is, the shorter the step you're going to take. The bigger tau is, the smaller alpha is going to be, and the more iterations you're going to need, okay? And that makes perfect sense, right? The, 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 the older the updates, the longer it's going to take to converge. Um, you also see that the more overlap there is, the bigger row is, um, the, the more iterations you're going to need, okay? So all of these things make sense. And the other things that I point out is this, these really do reduce to something that looks a lot like the constant step size analysis for straight SGD. In particular, they indicate that this is a 1 over k sort of process. To get precision epsilon, the number of iterations you need to take is inversely proportional to epsilon except for this log term, which doesn't really matter, okay? And that's exactly what we saw yesterday for, um, for just standard SGD. So to, to double the amount of precision, to make epsilon twice as small, you have to take twice as many steps, roughly. Okay, and here are some results. Um, comparing Hogwild on a multi-core machine, so we had a 12-core machine, uh, only, we use between 1 and 10 of the cores to actually do parallel SGD. The other two cores we use to shuffle the data, okay, to randomize the data. Because often when you uh, take a data set in, a, in an um, application of SGD, um, uh, it's not presented to you in a completely random fashion. So we sort of shuffle it and then just presented it to the cores serially, okay.
So what we compared were the average gradient scheme. This is the first one I mentioned, where each processor evaluates a core, and then they uh, evaluate a gradient, and then they average their results, and then take a step in that direction. The second one was the round robin scheme, where they take turns at updating uh, x. And the third one was Hogwild, which I just described. So you can see that for th these problems, this is a support, support vector machine problem. This is a matrix completion problem. This is a graph cut problem. They all have that partially separable structure. You can see that the round robin scheme really doesn't benefit at all from having multiple cores. And that's because all of these problems were problems, were problems where the evaluation of the gradient was very cheap. And so all these processes just spent most of their time waiting for their turn of updating x. Okay? These other two schemes did somewhat better. Um, uh, AIG was, um, uh, you know, there was some benefit from using multiple cores and speed ups for AIG of between three and five. But Hogwild uh, did considerably better. We don't, certainly don't get linear speed up. We don't get a factor of 10 speed up, but we get uh, on these problems five or five and a half or six um, in terms of uh, speed up over just a serial implementation. And here's some more details on um, on how we did on some bigger problems. Um, this constant delta here, I didn't tell you what delta was, and it, it did crop up in, it's another measure of how much interference there is between different terms in the sum. It did crop up in, in our original analysis, but when Richter redid the analysis a few weeks ago, he found we, we didn't need to look at delta. We only need rho. So again, big values of rho indicate lots of interference, small values in, indicate little interference. You can see the problems with, with small values of rho tended to give slightly faster speed ups in Hogwild on a 10 core machine. We got up to actually almost a factor of nine speed up on one problem. Uh, and, uh, and these are the absolute uh, processing times. Okay, and there's much we can do to extend this kind of approach um, to make it more parallel. So this assumption that each processor can read and write to a centrally located X uh, becomes a bit problematic as the number of cores goes up and as the size of X goes up and so on. So there are different ways you can think about scaling this. You could sort of give each processor um, hegemony over a particular subvector of X and have it do updates to just its subvector and then periodically communicate with some centrally stored X. Um, so there are many sort of things you can think of to do and we're trying out some of these now. Um, and in fact, there was a recent paper by Andrew Ng and uh, his colleagues uh, that was publicized in the New York Times about three weeks ago where they did a, a, a kind of stochastic gradient descent on an unsupervised learning problem on a deep, uh, deep learning network. I think he mentioned it last week in his talk. But it was a kind of stochastic gradient descent with some caching of the updates. So it's uh, quite a lot like uh, what I've just been telling you about. Okay, and here's some papers for future reading that, uh, that you can use uh, if you want some more details. All right, so let me switch gears and talk about the next topic. Oh, were there any questions before I head on? Yes, why? Yeah, I think we've done that. I can't give you the results, but um, the version where uh, you try to update the entire vector x after each gradient, I don't think is going to work very well. There's going to be too much memory contention. But if you pick some um, at random, some elements of x and update those, then the analysis still goes through. And I think that has a chance of working, but I can't tell you offhand what the results are. I think we've tried that at some time, but sometimes. But and of course, that, that question is relevant to deep learning often because the updates are quite dense usually. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, how uh, is it expressed in terms of cycles in time? No, it's, a, it's expressed in terms of number of iterations. So we assume that each time a processor accesses the X to update it, that counts as one iteration. But then tau is also a boundary for the number of uh, CPU resources to be used. So for the number of pipelines you're required. Number of processes, that's right, yeah. Yeah, so if you've got 10 processes, tau is going to have to be at least 10, right? Because uh, you're going to have to, in average, wait sort of, uh, there's going to be a delay of on average 10 iterations before you get to do your update. But of course, you want to make it bigger than that uh, because uh, you might get a, a subgrading that's harder to evaluate, so it might take you longer. And by the time you're ready to update, it might be 20 or 30 iterations beyond. <laughs>
Okay. All right. So now I want to say something about uh, sparse and regularized optimization. And again, this is a topic that's come up quite a lot. And Arthur Slam's talk yesterday, he talked uh, in some detail about this. And it's cropped up in, I think, a lot of the other talks last week as well. So the observation here is that you want to find an x that minimizes some function, but rather than get the exact minimum of f, you'd, you'd rather find an approximate minimum that has some sort of additional structure, okay? So the question is, how do you formulate the optimization problem so that it gives you a solution with the sort of structure that you're looking for? And here are some examples of the kind of structure, and again, Arthur told you about some of these yesterday, and I even mentioned them, some of them yesterday. So one kind of structure is that you want to get a vector x which only has a few non-zeros, mostly zero components. Um, you might want specific non-zero patterns in x. You might want sort of group sparsity where you want clusters of elements of x. Um, you, you want to allow clusters of elements of x to be non-zero but otherwise to be completely zero. Um, if you've got a, a problem with a matrix variable, you want, to, you want to get a low rank solution. If you're dealing with an image problem from image processing, you want, a, an image, you want to get out an image that looks sort of like a cartoon where you've got large areas of constant intensity or constant color with some edges in between. I'm sure Professor Osher will tell you more about that. And then there's a sort of more hazy concept of generalizability that comes from some of the early literature in machine learning where you want to choose an objective that trades off between fitting the data that you're given, empirically minimizing uh, over the, the, the empirical data set that you're given, and, uh, and getting a solution that generalizes. Okay? And so Vapnik talks about uh, this trade-off between data fitting and the complexity of the function that you use to fit the data. You want to keep the complexity as low as possible. Okay? So one way to achieve this goal of finding a structured solution is to modify the objective by adding on some regularization term, where you choose this function psi to induce the kind of structure that you're looking for, okay? So the challenge is how do you pick psi to match up with these different goals? And that's a significant challenge, is, is exactly how you design psi to, um, to achieve the, this, uh, the, the different kinds of structure that you're looking for. The other thing here is this parameter tau. So tau here is just a scalar. And generally, the bigger you make tau, the more emphasis you place on, on getting a structured solution. And so, for example, if you're dealing with an L1 norm, if psi is an L1 norm, which tends to induce sparsity in the solution, the bigger you make tau, the sparser the solution is going to be in general, OK? Because you're placing more emphasis on, on, uh, on reducing the number of non-zeros in the solution. Okay, so this is a sort of this is not the only way to get sparsity, but it's the one we'll talk most about. So I've got a whole laundry list of applications, and by the way, um, these slides I, they didn't appear on the website when I started my talk, but they might be there by now um, because I just sent them to Roland at about 8:30. Uh, so if you check the website now, you might you might find them. Certainly they'll be be there before too long. Um, but um, I've got a laundry list of applications. This is one that, that Arthur told you a lot about yesterday, uh, where you've got uh, a set of equations, ax equals b. It might be maybe overdetermined. It might be underdetermined. You'd like to find an x which approximately solves ax equals b, but which is also sparse. And so you can just add an L1 norm onto that to achieve that goal. Um, there's this uh, idea of group lasso. This is often known as lasso in the literature. That comes from a the terminology comes from a paper by Tib Sharani from 1997. That idea can be extended to group lasso, where you, you group the elements of x into different groups that somehow are naturally related in the model. And you'd like to turn those groups on and off as a group rather than as individual elements. And so instead of having an L1 norm, you instead have an L2 norm for each group, each subvector of elements. And you sum up that L2 norm, and that gives you a regularizer. Okay, which induces the kind of sparsity you're looking for. These groups can overlap, and I won't go over this slide in any detail, but life gets more complicated when you've got groups overlapping. And there are many models, in particular models associated with, with, with the, the, uh, the coefficients are naturally organized into a tree, as you get, for example, when you're dealing with wavelet representations of images. And there you want to sort of 
turn groups on and off, but the groups tend to overlap. The groups tend to be uh, parent-child pairs or subtrees of the main tree or whatever. Um, that actually, just incidentally, I'll just say that that optimization problem, when you've got overlapping groups, is somewhat harder to solve and requires uh, algorithms that are a little bit trickier than the case where the groups just se uh, separate out naturally. And Francis Bach um, has done a lot of work on that and his team in, uh, um, at, at INRIA. Um, in in uh, statistics, so going back to that lasso problem, one thing that people have looked at recently is replacing this L1 norm with another kind of regularizer that doesn't induce so much bias in the solution. The problem with doing with using this formulation is that um, the presence of the L1 norm tends to sort of uh, shrink the overall size of X, the X that you get from this model. Okay. Uh, in other words, it distorts the solution of the least squares problem a little bit unacceptably. So it is inducing sparsity, which is what you want, but the non-zero elements are also being affected by the presence of this term. And so people have been exploring in the statistics literature alternative, uh, alternative regularization terms that don't um, bring the same kind of bias to the solution. And these typically have this um, non-convex form. And two of them are called SCAD and MCP. And basically, they look sort of like L1. This is what the L1 absolute value function looks like. But they flatten out when the size of the XI element gets significantly big. Okay, And so you don't continue to pay a price as XI increases. You just sort of pay a fixed price past a certain point. So they're able to prove things about unbiasedness of the estimate you get from that regularizer. The difficulty with this is that it gives rise to a non-convex optimization problem. Okay, when you put that into the, when you add that to the least squares term, you get a non-convex problem, and as we all know, they're somewhat harder to solve. Um, compressed sensing has the same form as a lasso, but um, you're typically dealing with a problem where A has many more columns than rows, and A also has some additional very special properties under which you can prove that the L1 norm is giving you the same solution as you get as you would get by using just a cardinality count, a count of the number of non-zeros. So compressed sensing is a special case of lasso where um, which is tied mostly to signal processing type applications, where you can actually prove very nice properties about the solution that you get from this. Okay? And also the A in this case tends to be dense, but it's something that you can operate with fairly easily. I won't take, say too much more about that. Arthur again mentioned that that case again uh, yesterday. Um, other cases of, in which you want regularized solutions are support vector machines. Sometimes you're interested, if you're solving a linear SVM, you might be interested in a weight vector with relatively few non-zeros. In other words, you might want to do classification on the basis of just a small subset of the features. Okay? So you can achieve that by adding uh, an L1 norm to the objective. Um, you can do the same thing with logistic regression. And I've already told you about those kinds of problems, and, and you already know about them anyway, so I won't go into any more detail on that. Matrix completion problems have been very popular the last uh, few years as a sort of an ex as extension to some extent of compressed sensing and lasso. And the idea here is that you've got a matrix where you have some information about the matrix. It might be that you know individual elements from the matrix. It might be that you know some linear functions of the, of the elements of the matrix. Okay? So B collects all the observations that you're given about the matrix. A is a linear operator which maps the unknown matrix X to the observation space. And you'd like to find the X which sort of match, matches the observations pretty well, but also has some structure. And the structure we're talking about here is low rank. So you add on um, a, a regularization function psi that induces some sort of low rank. And as I mentioned yesterday, uh, one choice of psi here is the nuclear norm, simply the sum of singular values of x. And that sort of plays a very similar role to the L1 norm when you're dealing with a matrix variable. So by cranking up the value of tau, you'll typically get a solution of this problem where the rank of x keeps going down. Okay, It's smaller and smaller. There are other kinds of structure you might want to impose. People have done work recently on looking for solutions X that are a sum of a low rank matrix and an element wise sparse matrix. And so they can design regularizers that give rise to that kind of structure. Okay.
All right, so what is our, oh, what is one basic approach for solving these kinds of problems? Well, I mentioned this yesterday when I was talking about um, steepest descent type methods. And I made the, the note that when we were just solving an unconstrained problem, one way to look at what we were doing, we were taking this step in some chosen search direction, one way to look at what we were doing was that we were actually solving a little quadratic subproblem where the chosen search direction g appeared in the linear term and the quadratic term had the step length alpha appearing in the denominator of the weight there. So ignore the psi for the moment. If you just minimize this little quadratic, the minimizer is x minus alpha times g. And that's exactly the sort of method we were talking about yesterday. So shrinking type methods just extend that by just augmenting that subproblem by adding on the regularization term explicitly. And then defining the new iterate at z to be the minimizer of, of this subproblem. And as I mentioned yesterday, that uh, can be, in some cases, that can be easy to compute. It can, it can be relatively easy to, com to solve that subproblem. Another way to state this, it makes it look even more explicitly like the sorts of method we discussed yesterday, you can just sort of group these terms together and express this as 1 over 2 alpha times um, uh, z minus x minus alpha g, all right? So if, um, uh, again, if this term is not here, it's completely obvious that the minimizing z here is just x minus alpha g. That gives a residual of 0, okay? So this is just an alternative way to express this problem. So this is going to be our work workhorse approach for solving regularized problems where each subproblem has this form. And so a fundamental question is how do you solve this subproblem for a given value of x minus alpha g? So I'm going to define this thing called a shrink operator. And the shrink operator just says when I plug in this argument here, which I'll now call y, give me back the value of z which minimizes this problem, okay? So this is a little subproblem that you want to solve. So each iteration of a typical algorithm is that we take a step in the negative g direction where gk is defined by, for example, it can be a gradient of f, and then we apply this operator which corresponds to solving the subproblem, and that gives us a new iterate, okay? So this is going to be the, the basic approach that I'm going to talk about. So let's talk a little bit about how hard this little subproblem is to solve. In other words, how difficult is the shrink op operator to compute? Well, in the case of where psi is the L1 norm, as I said yesterday, you can write down a closed form solution in that case. And here it is. If you just plug in y, you plug in the value of alpha, you plug in the value of tau, the solution of the shrink operator is given by this formula here. And this takes approximately a you know, small multiple of n operations to compute, where n is the length of the vector. So you can do this very economically. When you've got a group sparse regularizer, that's where you aggregate the elements of x into groups and you want to turn those groups on or off rather than turning individual elements on and off. Again, you can write down in closed form, as long as a group, those groups are not overlapping, you can write down the solution of the shrink operator in closed form. Very simple in that case. When it's overlapping, things get more complicated. What about when psi is an indicator function of a closed convex set? Now this is sort of a sneaky way of imposing a constraint on z, okay? If I define psi to be, uh, to be a function that, that is zero when z is inside some set omega and infinity otherwise, what I'm really doing is restricting z to be an element of omega, okay? So this in a sense generalizes the case where I'm trying to solve a constrained problem where I want, I want x to belong to omega. And it still makes sense in that case. You can still work through this derivation. In that case, the shrink operator is just the projection of y onto the set omega, okay? So this is a nice way to sort of, uh, using this regularized formulation is a nice way to um, formulate a, a pretty wide variety of problems. Let's return for a moment to the nuclear norm problem where the shrink operator is you're going to have to solve uh, for a given y and a given alpha and a given tau you're going to have to solve a problem where you've got a Frobenius norm squared here between z and the given matrix y plus a nuclear norm. And it turns out that also has a closed form solution in a sense. The way you find it is you calculate the singular value decomposition of this matrix y, 
And then you take the diagonal, you take the singular values and you shrink them all towards zero. You subtract tau times alpha from every singular value. If it goes below zero, you just cut it off at zero, okay? And then you reconstruct using this modified value of sigma, you then apply it with the, the two orthogonal factors from the SVD and you reconstruct the matrix and that gives you the solution to this problem, okay? So again, you can generalize the shrink operator to matrix variables by just going through this, this set of operations. This is not necessarily very cheap, okay? Calculating the SVD is sort of more expensive than just doing the, the shrink for a vector, but in principle, it's, uh, you can write down exactly what the solution is. Okay, so here's maybe the most basic fundamental method that makes use of negative gradient direction and the shrink operator. And the idea is you choose the search direction to simply be the gradient or the negative gradient. And you step in that direction and then you shrink, okay? And I even talked about this, this, this approach yesterday. It goes by a number of names, forward backward splitting, iterative shrinking, thresholding, and so on. This can work well in some cases, okay? It works well if you're dealing with, um, uh, when you're dealing with a highly constrained problem. In other words, where the solution, uh, Z, really lies on a, in a fairly small ambient space, okay? Now, I use this sort of fancy term there. The simple thing you need to think about is when psi is the L1 norm, um, very often the true solution only has a few non-zero components, right? So if F is well conditioned on that subspace of just the non-zero components of the, the non-zero optimal components of X, then this approach can work pretty well, okay? Um, it doesn't work so well when the, uh, the, the subspace on which the solution lies is relatively large or when the um, restriction of F to that subspace is, is poorly conditioned, okay? Then this behaves like a, just a steepest descent method on a poorly conditioned problem and it's not particularly fast, okay? But on many applications, particularly in compressed sensing, this approach works pretty well. Even the convergence theory that I talked about yesterday for say short step steepest descent is very easily generalized to that case. If you take steps in the range from zero to two over L, where L is an upper bound on the um, eigenvalues of the Hessian, um, you can use that, all the tools that I told you about yesterday to prove that you get um, nice global convergence in the convex case. Now you can soup up this basic approach in many different ways. One way is that instead of just choosing a short step alpha, you can actually do a kind of a line search. And we mentioned that yesterday, right, where you, you actually searched along the negative gradient direction and you tried to pick a value of alpha that, uh, that gave you, uh, you know, somewhere close to the minimizer of f along that direction. You can play the same game here because alpha here is really a sort of a line search parameter. So you can try adapting alpha to make sure that you make a substantial decrease in the function at every step. Or you can do that basel i borwein type strategy that I told you about yesterday, where you are prepared to accept occasional increases in the function value uh, for the benefit of, uh, you know, over the long term, getting a faster overall convergence rate. So again, you can choose alpha using basel i borwein type formulas and plug it into that shrink operator and uh, get a reasonable algorithm. You can also use those accelerated gradient methods that I told you about. So for example, that FISTA method, where you add in sort of a momentum term as well as the, um, uh, as, as well as a, the negative gradient term. You can go back and look at the definition of FISTA that I gave you yesterday, and in the step where you do the, the steep, where you take a step in the negative gradient direction, you just replace that step with this gradient shrink operation. And the rest of the method is the same and you can prove the same sorts of convergence results, okay? All of these methods, ultimately what they do when you, when you apply them to uh, an L1 norm regularizer or some other kind of regularizer, they ultimately reduce the search space to the, the sort of interesting uh, subspace, okay? The interesting manifold. In the end, they sort of mostly figure out which um, uh, parts of the space that X lives in are not that important and focus the search on minimizing F on the interesting subspace, okay? All right. Uh, I'll just mention this quickly. I sort of uh, made the observation earlier that um, uh, 
These problems often are easy to solve when you're doing strong regularization, when you're cranking up the value of tau and really make this, making the solution very, very structured. Often these sorts of methods work pretty well. Um, but when tau is small, when the, when the function that you're minimizing is much closer to f, and there's not much regularization going on, often these gradient-based methods suffer from all the defects of first-order methods or, or sub-gradient methods in that they're pretty slow. But you can use this sort of continuation strategy where suppose you really want to solve this problem for some target value of tau. Uh, and instead of just diving in and plugging in tau equals tau f and solving the problem, you can use a sort of continuation strategy where you start with a much larger value of tau. And so you start by solving a very strongly regularized problem. And you find an approximate solution to that problem, and then you decrease tau a little bit and use the solution that you just found as a starting point for the modified problem with a smaller tau, okay? And you continue that process. You keep chasing the solution. You keep using warm starting. You keep decreasing tau until you eventually you get down to the value of tau that you're interested in. So that approach is often more effective than just trying to plug in the tau that you want and solving it as a one-off one -off problem. And there's a recent report by Zhao and Zhang where they actually analyze this strategy and they're able to prove some results about why it's effective. Um, and I, I told you yesterday about dual averaging. This is an approach of Nesterov where he, um, uh, one of the things that he does is instead of just using the latest gradient uh, and, and trying to step in that direction, he averages over all the gradients that you've seen so far. You can do this, I already pointed out that you can do the same thing when you've got estimates of the gradient at each iterate rather than the exact gradient. Again, you can average those estimates. And the behavior of that averaged gradient in some sense is smoother and more robust than the, average, than the behavior of individual gradients. So you can do the same thing here when you've got a regularization term. You can just use the same approach where you have the average gradient in the linear term you have sort of a damping term here that stops you from moving too far. Now you just insert this regularization term. And the algorithm basically goes through. And in fact, there was a paper by Zhao where he sort of extended the Nesterov idea to the regularized case, okay, and proved a bunch of things about that. And you can still get this sort of order of um, 1 over square root of k type convergence rate, just as you got for the, um, for the, uh, uh, for the case without the regularizer. Okay, uh, there are other ways to extend stochastic gradient to regularized problems. So one of them is um, you just basically do this shrinking, but you, you just use an, a gradient estimate, an SGD gradient estimate. So this looks exactly like that Fukushima uh, mean a you know, fundamental prox linear problem, except instead of using the grad of f here, I'm just using it, the latest estimate of the grad of f. So that was analyzed by these authors uh, in uh, a paper a few years ago. They generalized this to mirror descent where you bring in averaging of the subgradients and you bring in a generalized prox function uh, in the shrink operator. They did that in uh, that algorithm is called COMID. And there are various other attempts to to bring in stochastic gradient ideas into this setting, okay? I'll just mention briefly this, this issue that I've alluded to a few times, which is that when you've got an L1 minimizer, for example, you know that at the solution, most of the components Xi star are gonna be zero, okay? Uh, and you'd sort of like to home in on the, on the non-zero components. I mean, you'd like to be able to know early on in the iterative process, which components are going to go to zero and are definitely going to stay at zero. Because then you can forget about those components for the rest of the optimization and just focus your, um, uh, your efforts on minimizing over, a, over the interesting components, the ones that at least have a chance of being non-zero at the solution. So it's an interesting question to ask is that all these different methods that we talked about do they do a reasonable job at sort of setting the uninteresting components to zero early on and progressively reducing the size of the subspace as they go? Or do they, you know, generally produce iterates that have all the components of X non-zero and only in the limit do the zero components really go to zero, okay? So it turns out some algorithms have that first property where they eliminate the uninteresting ones early on, 
other algorithms have the, the second property. Um, and that whole concept can be generalized beyond x1. You can talk about uh, more general kind of regularizers and more general kinds of structure. But x1 sort of illustrates the case pretty well. Now, what would be the advantage to, to knowing some estimate of the subspace, of the interesting subspace, the interesting non-zero components of x? Well, one possible advantage is that if you're able to home in on a very small subspace, you might want to switch your algorithmic strategy to something beyond a first order strategy, okay? So if your x has 10 to the 6 variables, but you're applying a first order method that tells you fairly quickly that only about 100 out of those 10 to the 6 have a chance of being non-zero at the solution, then you might want to just discard the, um, what is it, 900 and, uh, 990,000, um, 900 uh, uninteresting elements and switch to some sort of different algorithmic strategy that just searches on the 100 el uh, elements that might be non-zero, okay? The strategy might be completely different if you're dealing with a much smaller ambient space. So identification is potentially an interesting property here. Now, what kinds of algorithms might do identification and which ones might not? It turns out that for reasons that are not too hard to understand, methods that you'll use dual averaging and shrinking actually can do a pretty good job of identification. And the reason for that is not too hard to see. In, when, you got, when you've got a dual averaging algorithm, your gradient estimate is converging to the optimal gradient value, okay? And that's because as the iterates go on and on, they're basically all getting closer and closer to x star. And so your gradient estimates are being based on you know, basically on the same point. They're all being based on points that are very close to x star. And when you take the running average of those, the running average is pretty much going to converge to the optimal gradient. So in the end, each, av each dual average step looks a lot like a step taken with the optimal gradient. And we know that steps taken with the optimal gradient do a good job at identifying optimal manifolds. Okay? So the stochastic, uh, the dual average case behaves a lot like uh, just gradient projection and it tends to find the right manifold or at least a reasonable estimate of it. Methods that do averaging of the prime literates don't do a good job of finding the right manifold. In fact, generally, they never get, uh, none of the components of X get to zero in general until you write out the solution. And the reason for that is easy to see as well because if you, if you give your solution estimate as an average over all the X's that you've generated so far at every iteration, then for each iterate, um, uh, probably at least one iteration, for each, for each element i of the vector x, probably at least one iteration, xk, had that value of i at some non-zero value. So it's going to contribute a non-zero value to the average, to the overall iterates that you've seen, okay? And unless you get some very lucky cancellation, it's always going to be non-zero. The average is always going to be non-zero in element i. Okay, so those methods are not going to identify. All right, so that's enough, and this is a good time to break, actually. Uh, I've got a whole laundry list of, um, of papers in that area. Okay, so time for coffee, and we'll see you again in half an hour.